let's talk about digital identity, the podcast connecting identity and business. I am your host, Oscar Santolayo. Hello. More and more, we hear phrases like reclaim your identity. Some people care, some people don't. But reclaiming identity from who? Who owns my identity today in There are better ways we can do this. For that, we have a very special guest today, Diane Joyce. Diane has provided thought leadership, vision, and innovation in the digital transformation of financial institutions. Diane has worked with blue chip corporations to implement the technology and service architectures required to become certified identity providers as part of the Gov.uk Verify Identity Scheme. Diane has worked with government departments, setting up a pan-government identity community and work with leading IDAM vendors to address the need for secure and scalable identity federation to enable collaboration between public and private sector organizations. Diane champions technology innovation to provide users with a frictionless and safe digital experience. Hello, Diane. Hi, Oscar. It's great talking with you, Diane. Thank you. I know you do many things and you have done many things, <laughs> very interesting things. But I would like to hear first from you, what was your journey, your personal journey to this world of digital identity? I've worked in technology. I started as a programmer many, many years ago. I've worked in identity for some time now, but I started out in integration and security And I saw two catalysts that I thought were going to change the technology world. And alongside those, the problem of identity needed solving. So the first was the internet. Suddenly we could connect to anyone, anywhere, but we didn't really know who we were connected to and how did we know mm -hmm. it was them the next time we connected. And when you added to that the dot-com boom and the subsequent e-commerce boom, now it's become even more important to understand who it is we're speaking to. And the second thing is cloud computing. Following the internet and e-commerce, cloud computing solved a problem that I don't think most organizations knew that they had. Their identity model was within the walled fortress of the data center, and so therefore they could control all the identity there. Cloud computing changed that and made the evolution of technology and services even faster. But now identity had B2B and B2C, and they were outside the control of the organization at times. So that was quite a paradigm shift. So again, these are the two catalysts that I, I saw that needed some sort of identity providing, and not just for people, but also for devices. And of course, mm -hmm. the third one would be the Internet of Things. So I spent a lot of time researching, reading, aligning with the emerging identity thought leaders before getting my first break at the UK Post Office, who were bidding to provide identity for a major government department. And this later morphed into gov.uk Verify. And we were at the beginning of bringing together federated identity. So all the way through that, I guess we were kind of making it up as we went along, as technologies emerged, as threats emerged, as the way that consumers behave changed, we started to get something more robust. But primarily, as I think you said in the beginning, I'm a technologist and I want to use technology as the enabler to make a safe and frictionless journey. I don't want to put technology in because it's fun. Sure. Yeah, I see you have seen the, the evolution of uh, well, the internet and the services that came gradually uh, Uh, E-commerce, you mentioned, then you mentioned uh, the cloud services. In which moment uh, there were already some tools for managing some way or another the, the identity? Um, you felt that there were not enough tools of technology at some point? Uh, how you get involved in the identity? Well, I, I think the way we solved identity was that we did it within the World Fortress. So each organization managed its own identities and it tended to put you through a bit of a stringent process and you had to log in and be recognized. And so each organization did that independently. Now, when they pushed their services to the cloud, mm. they could no longer do that in the same way. And I think technology did evolve where 
um, single sign-on and federated identity started to enable that, but along with that came the threats. So the identity management of if I set up an identity and I start to proliferate that among a number of organisations, the moment someone gets my identity, they've now got access to all sorts of things. So I think the model changed from the organisation keeping it within their fortress Mm -hmm. to suddenly the identity moved more towards the individual. Not quite there yet, but we're moving that way. Right. Yeah, as you said, a very long time ago, the organisations could just build a database and have their all the identities they they needed inside in house build their own systems etc that was possible long time ago mm-hmm. but when the services were exposed outside especially with the cloud services as you said yeah that's a completely different story you started to already mention it that the identity becoming more for the individual so and that mm-hmm. is one of the things we have we want to discuss today is who owns your identity who owns my identity and what would you say if the question is just who owns my identity? Well, for me, actually, it's a really easy answer. I think the individual always owns their identity, digital or otherwise, because it uniquely identifies them. But I think owning their identity is different from managing their identity. And I think that's what the real question is. Who manages my identity and who do I trust to be able to help me manage my identity? Because I don't think most people really care about owning their identity. I think they realize they have to log on and identify themselves in order to do something. I want to buy the shoes. And if I really want those shoes, I'm pretty much going to do anything I need to get those shoes. So I think the management of the identity is is the real question here. Mm -hmm. And I think the individual still owns that. And that's a big change from the data fortress model where each organization owned my identity. They owned my credentials. They owned my um, assurances, all of that. But I had to do that with every single organization. So now all of my data is out there in multiple places. Okay, so the individual owns owns their own identity, but many organizations and also the individual are managing the identity. I think there's a, a little bit of a hype. We're moving a little bit to a hybrid model. And I think at the moment, we're not in a place where the individual really understands the value of their identity. But it's getting more so the more breaches we have and the more the individual is inconvenienced, the more they'll start to value and protect their identity. But I've never, ever heard anyone say, I've got to get myself a digital identity. (laughs) You know, I've got to get the shoes. I've got to get on a plane. I've got to do these things. But And I know I have to do things to do that. So I don't think they really understand it at the moment. And I I think this is where technology can enable things. At the moment, as I say, we've moved from the walled garden where everyone has their own database. We morphed a little bit into a federated service where we had identity providers. And that's very much the space we played in and some of the organizations I've worked in. So you could do a single sign-on an identity provider would do all the assurance against your identity and say, I'm certain to this level that it's Diane and I'm certain that it's actually Diane that's come back again and again. Because I think there's one thing about establishing the identity. I think the second thing is really about is it the same person who owns the identity when they come back? So the whole authentication and account takeover scenarios. And I think we're starting to morph into more of a hybrid model Mm -hmm. particularly when I look at the mobile technologies, the digital wallets that I can have, where I could carry a a little credential that's been minted by a trusted source that says, I know that Diane is over 18. And if I could give that, if you think about it as a little digital card, that I could give it to someone and they go, oh, yes, Diane was checked as over 18 by post office on this date. That's really what we want to be doing. I'm not giving my date of birth. I'm not giving any information about me. Mm -hmm. But that relying party will go back to the assuring party and say, yes, it's Diane. But this is in my digital wallet, so I can reuse this in multiple digital wallets in multiple places. So I think we're morphing more to giving more responsibility 
to the individual, but allowing them to choose who manages it. Also to clarify, because this the concept itself of um, my identity and I own my identity is that my identity is, is relatively abstract because, uh, for instance, the, the government might have a, a lot of about myself more than more than just uh, let's say the the movie theater mm-hmm. web shop that has some some information about myself. So, what are all these identity that I have in this social media? I have in this web shop. I have in the mm-hmm. um, the government. Each of them are my identity, or what each of those are. I think that's an interesting, I, I see my identity as I am Diane, but I have multiple personas. Uh-huh. And I think this is the model that um, having these little tokens that we can give is I can have a persona when I interact with government. They need to know a little bit more about me and maybe I do exchange a little bit of data with them. In fact, they're probably one of the greatest holders of data about me. But then I also have a healthcare persona who, <laughs> who wants different information about me. Yes. Um, I have a banking and financial services and then I have a social profile where maybe I don't want everyone really to know where I live, what my address is. And again, that's the model of not having to have all of these identities managed by different people where I have to have different credentials for every single identity. I would like one or more credentials that uniquely identify me then I can decide mm-hmm. which persona I'm going to be for who I'm at interacting with. So if I'm buying alcohol in a bar, they just want to know mm-hmm. I'm 18. They actually don't really care that my name is Diane or anything mm-hmm. about me, but they just want to know that I'm 18. And that's all I want them to know. Right. Okay. And you also mentioned earlier about uh, the breaches, for instance, re- reasons to to manage the identity and protect our identities in a, in a proper way. Mm-hmm. Uh, do, do you think that today the majority of people really care about uh, protecting and owning their own identity? How, how do you feel about that? Not yet, but I, I do think it's starting to inconvenience people. So, no. It was interesting. I was at a fraud and payments conference recently, and I asked everyone in the room how many people had reused passwords and 50% mm. said yes they they reused passwords and then I asked them how many use password managers and generators and 50% of the room indicated they did and these are people who understand fraud mm-hmm. people who understand how credential stuffing you know all the attack vectors work and yet these are the people 50% of whom are breaking some of the fundamental rules that we're, we're trying to get out there. So I don't know how we can expect the individual to really be able to respond in any other way either. So I think they're not inconvenienced enough yet, but as fraud rises, you're going to find more and more of the organisations are going to push back to the consumer and say, actually, you did this wrong or you didn't follow our terms and conditions by having the appropriate software on your devices, you know, your Uh device health. And as they start to push back more and more, it's going to hurt. And that's when it's going to start to become more and more. The individual will start to look at different ways of doing things. And we in the industry need to be in a position where we can help them because I'm not sure the moment we are. Well, actually, that's an interesting point you said. Uh, you ask uh, your audience in a, in a conference and half-half, no? half people <laughs> really don't care or are very careless. Mm-hmm. And the other, uh, yeah, definitely use parts of managers so or really care about that. Do you think that in there are already some organizations in which their terms and conditions tell explicitly you should use a password manager? Not yet. But I, I do see terms and conditions coming up where they say you can't reuse passwords. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And the industry, it was interesting. We had quite a big debate on it. Everyone goes, well, we need to move from the passwords. And I'm like, of course we do, but that's some time off. <laughs> so we need to solve the problem today because the amount of yeah. account takeover is really grown exponentially. And organizations can't sustain the cost for much longer I don't think and in fact some of the bankings are already pushing back saying well look you gave your credentials to someone what can I do so it is interesting that 
people are starting to become more aware. And if you look at some of the campaigns, particularly in the UK, we've had a lot of campaigns about banking, about um, banks will never ask you for information. They will never mm -hmm. do all of these things. So we're doing a lot of campaigning out there. However, the other day I did an unusual transaction and my bank phoned me mm. and I asked them to authenticate themselves because I'm like, I have no idea who you are. Yes. And they said, well, we've rung you about a transaction. I said, I understand that, but you have to authenticate yourself to me because I don't know who <laughs> you are. I said, I'm going to hang up and I'm going to ring the bank back. And I knew I had actually done the transaction that they said, but, you know, ringing me up and asking me to authenticate myself and provide information. And I actually said to them, I said, you just sent out an email saying, we will never ask you for information and you're asking me for information. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did actually send that back to the bank and said, you sent me this email and then immediately you did this. And I said, if you put a safe and secure word there, something that you could tell me, I would have talked to you. But instead I had to go yeah. away and find another device to call back on so that I could be sure that it was you. Mm. And we had quite a big discussion with it because I actually knew some of the security people in that. And I said, your literature – needs to change, but so does mm. organizations need to authenticate themselves as well because this is the biggest threat at the moment, the social engineering. Yes. And I'm really good at it. I could probably get passwords out of most people. <laughs> so, yeah, the threats are changing. It's not all technology. Yeah, that's also a very good example now that um, the bank um, is advocating something that is, is in the right direction, but the processes are not aligned Yes. completely yet. Yeah. And I do have a safe word on that bank for when I log in. They show me it or they show me a picture. So they could have easily mm -hmm. used that. You're right. Still a lot of work to do in many organizations, definitely. But also it's, it's good uh, what you said. And it's very interesting uh, perspective that the companies, the organizations are pushing back to towards the user. No? The user should have more uh, responsibility, uh, more active in protecting their identity. And it, that's also um, because it's in their organization's own interest. No, it's actually a business value for the for the organizations to to give the right the right ways to for the for the individuals for the users to to protect their identity. Mm -hmm. We're in a much better position to help the users protect their identity. In cyber, we tend to understand some of the threat models, and we're in the best position to do that. But I think it just takes time. And investment. Mm -hmm. And what about the idea of the the ultimate responsibility for uh, for an individual to control their own identity? And is thinking of uh, the self self sovereign identity, for instance. What do you think? I think long term that will be the case, and I think this is where technology does actually come in. So I think, as I said, I think there's a halfway house where we have these mm -hmm. verifiable credentials and an individual us one or more organizations, whether they identity providers, wallet providers, to provide that for them. Because I think at the moment it's a bit of a big leap and what we really need to educate consumers in is don't give your data away all the time because the more data mm. you give away, the number of breaches that are coming out there, we're starting to see the rise of identity theft but also synthetic identities where they're partially true and and they, they start to generate identities that it's no longer the short con where they just go and steal something immediately. They're building these identities for longer term use. So I think that's perhaps where we can help instead mm -hmm. of having every organization saying you need to give me your name, your address, your date of birth, your picture of your passport and all of this. So every organization is holding this. We do need to go more into this. I'll have those credentials in a trusted place. It's a little bit like the federated model, but with the technology, you don't always have to go to the identity provider to do the credentialing because I think most organizations want to do the credentialing themselves, but they just need assurance that it's the right person on the end of the line. So yes. I don't think we can push that much onto the consumer. As I said, at a fraud seminar, half the room knew they were doing something wrong. 
And again, it comes down to the risk models. I also think the technology has moved on so much that the really the authentication space has really taken off and we have so much ability now to actually understand who's on the end of the line by using the, the technology that we should be doing that, you know, risk-based models, we should be collecting data. We know enough from the mobile phone devices to know, is it the same device we've seen before? Is it on a network mm -hmm. we recognize? Is it in a place that we recognize? What's the health of the device? Is there any apps on the device that have just been loaded recently? And what does that mean? So we, we have enough to build up a picture of, of that individual and if something's slightly wrong, then let's ask them to do something slightly differently. And, you know, maybe we take them through a couple of steps, but don't put the friction in place all the time. Put it in when normal behavior is this something not quite right. And it may be quite valid that it's not right. I may be on a totally different network that um, no one's seen. Um, I have two SIMs in my phone, so... I swap one of the SIM cards out mm. on a regular basis. And so, of course, I get the SIM swap, which means I have to step up my authentication. So I think the authentication, the devices, the technology is there to take that friction from the user, and we can do all of that in the background. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's definitely good news that that has um, evolved so much. Yeah. What about regulations such as the GDPR? How much are these helping? Do you know, I think GDPR is a great step in the right direction. And I think initially we're all interested to see how much bite it would have. And I think the British Airways breach fines um, showed that it really does have teeth. But I think it possibly needs a few tweaks or maybe it's just the, the initial processes. So the 72-hour notification and engagement with the regulator is quite tough. When an organisation is breached, it really needs to focus on finding out what happened, how, and fixing mm -hmm. it. And I think maybe perhaps a lighter touch within the reporting 72 hours, you know, to say, hey, we've been breached, we don't know what it is yet, and it takes generally mm -hmm. more than 72 hours, but the organisation should be focused on fixing it, not preparing something for the regulator so that they can tell the regulator what happened. And I think it's great because it does focus them on protecting data. But if you think about a breach, an organization has been breached and they've already incurred brand damage. And that's quite a big one because we do tend to move away from breached organizations. They've obviously mm. often incurred substantial costs to identify and fix the problem. And then they've also got the financial loss from the actual breach. So... They're also a victim of crime, so I'm not sure how the massive fines work. Maybe we need a little bit more leniency in some situations or, you know, your first strike, you know, unless you've done something clearly really badly, mm -hmm. that it's a bit more lenient. Because I think if my house was broken into and someone stole belongings, belonging to someone else, would the police then find me? because my house had been broken into, because the organizations are actually a victim of crime. But the really great thing, I think, with GDPR is it's helped organizations move from the model where data is value and therefore we gather as much as we possibly can, just in case we have some need in the future to use mm -hmm. it. Yes. You know, lots of organizations were building these enormous data lakes of information, which they probably really didn't have much idea how they were going to use them. Others, of course, did monetize that, the data lakes and understand how to use them. So the great thing is, you know, the explicit reason for capturing data and the fines for using that data in another way, I think are great. So I think that's a great step towards privacy. Yes, yes, I agree. So organizations now, they need really compelling reasons to collect Yes. unnecessary data. I think so. And I think that's part of, you know, I talked before about the individual doesn't need to give all the data away. Mm -hmm. What about CIM, Customer Identity and Access Management? How these also help? I'm kind of in two minds on this because when I tend to think of CIM, I tend to think of them as each organization captures and manages an identity. So they capture all the customer information 
and they have different credentials, although they can actually use single sign-on um, across the SIAMs. Again, I think it's more burdensome for the customer. It's almost a little bit back down to the data fortress model where everyone had their identity systems. So I'd like to see it evolve into a more distributed model with the individual more in control. So, you know, my ideal SIAM would be the ability to use one or more digital wallets and one or more different credentialing systems to access multiple organizations. So that would be my ideal SIAM. What are today examples of wallets or are there already today? They're evolving and there's, as self-sovereigns are starting to come more to the front, yes. But we've got new verifiable credential standards, which have just been agreed, which those are the tokens, the little cards that I talked about we can pass around. So organizations are starting to build wallets towards that. What we haven't yet got is organizations that are sharing across the wallets yet. But I think that is the next evolution because no one's going to stick to a single digital wallet. I'm going to have, again, I might have different wallets according to my persona, mm -hmm. but I want to be able to share that one piece of information across all of them. I don't want to have to prove myself time and time again. So I think we're moving that way, and that's particularly where the self-sovereign model um, works. And I think with the concepts of verifiable credentials, self-sovereign, it's starting to take shape. And the big players like the Microsofts, the MasterCards are all moving in this direction at the moment as mm -hmm. our Google. So it's starting. Yes, definitely great to know that there's um, many, many companies, um, technology vendors and organizations are are working on that today. And so we are going to see more more tools and, and resources. Yeah, very interesting discussion about <laughs> who owns my identity and how, how to protect it. Changing a little bit of topic, I know you you spend lately a lot of time on this organization, Women in Identity. Could you tell us a bit what are you doing there lately? Yes, so Women in Identity is a not-for-profit organization. We're looking at diversity and inclusion in the digital identity space. So The name of our organization is Women in Identity. It started as a bunch of women in identity, but it's, it's about everyone. It's about mm -hmm. inclusion. So we launched in June last year, and we're just getting the organization set up now. So I, I'm the events and country manager for Women in Identity. So that means a lot of organizations or conferences come to us because they want diversity, not only in their audiences, but also in the speakers. So we're starting to put together a speaker bank of women who can speak. And we also go out and we explain what women and identity is about. And, you know, and it really is about making our industry think about diversity and avoiding bias and making sure that everyone can have an identity. And the second thing I'm doing is setting up the country chapters for that. So we will have organizations in different countries at the moment we've got the US we've got Canada we've got Germany Netherlands UK and just starting up on Australia so again we can start to build a big community about making sure our, our industry recognizes that we need that diversity and it's partially about supporting women in the industry and helping them but it's also making sure that software vendors are building for diversity so you know there's been quite a few mm -hmm. issues um recently with bias and ai and also bias and facial recognition so the more that diverse our actual industry is the more we can bring that in to the software so that it can work for everyone and we want it to work for everyone anywhere so it's really exciting It's a not-for-profit and I'm a volunteer, but mm -hmm. we've got an amazing team of women who are just so passionate about making this work. Excellent. I, I can hear your passion. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, fabulous. My last question is a question for, for anybody, not only for people who are in the digital uh, identity community. For anybody, give us a tip to protect our own digital identity. I'm going to do two, if I may. The first yes. one is, Passwords are not dead. We would love them to be. They're not. Use a password manager mm -hmm. and generate passwords. There are a number of great password managers out there now. 
they go across all your devices so you're never without your password and let it generate a password. If you can't do that with your passwords, make them longer sentences that you will remember. Don't reuse them. It takes two minutes for a credential stuffing to take a password and run it across the major organisations that you probably interact with. I think the second one is more UK focused Mm -hmm. and it's more about identity theft. Sign up for a credit file service. There are a number of them that are free and on a regular basis, have a look at your credit file and see who's pinged your credit file. So every time you do something in a financial institution, take out a credit card, get insurance, do something, you'll end up with a marker against your credit file. If you see markers that you don't know about, tends to be that someone's got your identity and often what they do is they go to an insurance comparison website to see whether they've got all the details right and yes, it comes back and yes, they can get insurance. And then they tend to go to the financial services products. All credit files have a list of your financial instruments. Check your bank accounts, credit cards and make sure that you know them all and that their balances are approximately what you'd expect. And the third thing is check your addresses. Make sure you recognize all the addresses that are against your credit file because, again, change of address. If I create a new credit card on on your behalf, I'll probably send it to a new address. So that, I think, in the UK and, and maybe in other countries, the States definitely, these are things you should do on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with this uh, way of doing So. Who manages these uh, credit files? Is it a bank? No, um, we have data aggregators called credit reference agencies. So uh-huh. Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, mm-hmm. they all absorb all the information from the financial services and various organizations and bring it in to, as a data aggregator. And so when you open a bank account, they tend to call a credit reference agency, mm-hmm. first of all, to check that it's really you and are you credit worthy. And so anyone who calls in leaves a marker against your account. And, uh-huh. and so there are free services and there are paid for services as well where you can actually go in and look to see who's been looking at your credit file. So it's quite valuable. And if you see something that on your credit file you don't recognize, the credit reference agencies can then help you by you marketers. I don't know this. They'll then investigate it further. It's a great service in the UK and in the US. I'm not sure about other countries, how the data aggregators work. But, yeah, I've actually given that advice to someone and they came back and said, I've got five extra credit cards. And I'm like, oh, you need to ping them. (laughs) And her identity had been compromised. Okay, yeah, definitely it's a, it's a good advice where, where these systems are, are very widely used, like you say in UK and US. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very good that you, you share this advice. Thanks a lot, Diane. It was great talking with you. Please let us know how we can find you and, and also the organizations you work for. So um, my Twitter handle is Kiwi I Day Girl, also on LinkedIn as Diane Joyce. At the moment, I'm working for Women and Identity. Excellent. Again, thanks a lot, Diane, and all the best. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk About Digital Identity, produced by UbiSecure. Stay up to date with episode at ubisecure.com slash podcast or join us on Twitter at ubisecure and use the hashtag LTADI. Until next time, 